I guess without without further ado, I, th I think we can get started. Uh, Brian Moran, give me a thumbs up if you're ready to go. I love it. All right. Well, uh, thank you everybody uh, for joining us for st storage success stories. Um, we are going to take the next hour or so to kind of run through uh, a little bit about Davenport Group. We're going to talk a little bit about some storage, and then we're going to have some fun with uh, making these smoky cocktails that Matt and I were we're talking about. Um, Anthony, I see you never got your drink kit. Uh, I will have marketing make sure that we get something in your hands here. Uh, I apologize I didn't get sent to you uh, in time for this, but I'm sure uh, we'll get something out to you soon. So <clears throat> let me allow, I'll introduce myself. My name is Ryan Gray. I'm a senior account executive here at Davenport Group based out of Seattle. Uh, I've been with Davenport Group almost 12 years now, and um, I work hand in hand with Brian Moran, who is our senior sales engineer who's on the call. Uh, Brian, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, Brian Moran, I am on the sales engineering team at Davenport Group. I started uh, coming up on seven years ago, but uh, have spent uh, the 10 years prior to that at Dell and EMC in, in various roles. So really spending the last 17 years uh, really focused on uh, storage and, and designing storage technologies. So uh, thank you all for joining today. Thank you, Brian. So I'd like to kind of run through a little bit of a quick agenda here and just kind of talk a little bit about some housekeeping items. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about Davenport Group. We're going to have an overview of Dell PowerStore storage. We're going to talk a little bit about some case studies that uh, we have done. And then I've got uh, a couple of actual Davenport Group customers uh, on the webinar with us today, and they're going to talk a little bit about their experience with us. We'll talk a little bit about some of our managed services, and uh, I think the main reason everybody is here is for the spooky mixology. So we will definitely look forward to that as we go into the afternoon. Uh, I would like to introduce um, John Baudet and Jimmy Derrick. These are Davenport Group customers. They're going to be on the panel for kind of our customer success stories. Uh, John, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is John. I'm with Bailey Nurseries. We are a uh, wholesale agricultural nursery based out of the Midwest. Um, been with Bailey Nurseries a little over 15 years. Done anything from the help desk tickets, uh, a little bit of supervision, storage, backups. Um, like a lot of people on this call, just a lot of IT stuff. So had a long relationship with Davenport over the last five to 10 years, and uh, the power store was one of those solutions that we recent recently implemented. That's great. Thank you, John. Uh, and Jimmy Derrick. Uh, Jimmy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. My name is Jimmy Derrick. I'm been with Smith Anderson here in Raleigh, North Carolina for over 10 years now. I've been in IT for well over 20. Um, during all kinds of roles from consulting to IT manager to IT security manager now. So handling anything and everything in between, just like John. So. Glad to be here. Well, we really appreciate you both joining uh, and we look forward to hearing more about kind of your interaction with Davenport Group and the success that we've had together. Uh, before I turn it over to um, Brian Moran, we'd like to introduce uh, Jace McConnell, who's going to be the mixologist this afternoon to kind of talk us through these spooky cocktails. Uh, Jace is one of the South's most recognizable and respectable bartenders. Uh, he was named Eater Magazine's Young Gun in 2013. His work has been featured in numerous publications from Garden and Gun to Popular Mechanics. So I look forward to the mixology probably the most, to be quite honest. Before I go into about Davenport Group, I would like to encourage people to uh, come off mute. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to chime in, uh, or you can use the little uh, raise your hand emoji. Uh, we will have some people kind of moderating the chat to uh, answer any additional questions that you have. So. So let's talk a little bit about Davenport Group. Uh, who are we? You know, why is it important? Um, Davenport Group is a Dell Titanium partner specializing in data center solutions. So if you think servers, storage, networking, virtualization platforms like VMware, Hyper-V, multi-cloud, 
Uh, I have a um, counterpart who uh, always says the Davenport group can do everything from the mouse to the cloud. So <clears throat> for those of you that uh, know us and know us well, thank you for joining. Um, for those of you that are new, I want to touch on a couple things on this slide. A majority of our customers do business with us. Um, <clears throat> one, because of the technology that we sell. We believe that Dell has the best technology in the industry. We see Michael Dell's vision for IT, and um, we have a very, very similar vision. But most importantly, our customers do business with us because of our engineering group. Our engineers are the bread and butter of Davenport Group. They are the ones that make our customers successful in all of the projects that we work on. A majority of our customers were former customers of ours, working in multiple roles from system administrator to director of IT. Uh, they liked how we did business so much that uh, they decided to come work here. All of our engineers are certified in the technologies that we sell in order to implement them as well as support our customers after point of sale. So customer experience is at the heart of what we do. We have a mantra that we treat every customer as if they're our only customer. And we truly believe without our customers, we would not have a business. So thank you to everybody. Um, for those of you that have not worked with us, we hope that we have the opportunity to work with you very, very soon. So let's talk technology. Uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Brian Moran and uh, Brian's gonna talk to us about PowerStore. Brian? Great, thanks Ryan. And uh, before I get started, I mean, this is my only slide about PowerStore today or, or about some of the technology and PowerPoint just did a reboot. Love it. There we go. Are we back? Looks good. Sorry about that. Okay, here we are. Um, and the reason I included this slide is just to be a uh, kind of overview slide, an introduction to what PowerStore is as a platform, some of the things that are built into PowerStore, and it's really just an introduction. The, the meat of what we wanted to spend today talking about are just, you know, examples of where we have already seen successes with PowerStore, spending time, you know, with, with the, uh, Jimmy and John that have joined us live to, to talk about their experiences. Uh, so really, this is just a uh, kind of high level. If you have questions or you want to dive deeper into technology, we'd love to follow up with you, you know, in, in a later session. Um, but again, you know, if you do have questions, feel free to, to put them in the chat and we can get those addressed right away. So PowerStore is Dell's newest mid-range storage platform. It was launched in the summer of 2020. So it's been out for about three and a half years or so. Um, what it is, is it's a... Uh, Two U or start off as a, a two U appliance with redundant controllers in all NVMe storage capacity. Um, it started off with NVMe drives, but traditional um, protocols back in, into your in server environment, right? So iSCSI, Fiber Channel, it supports file and block. Uh, but with software updates that have come out uh, since the initial launch, you know, free updates to, to customers that already deployed PowerStore. PowerStore added the ability to do NVMe over fabric, right? So if you had fiber channel, instead of doing a traditional fiber channel, you can do NVMe over, over, you know, uh, over fiber, or even now with a more recent release, NVMe over TCP, right? So think like, you know, I, I think I saw a few PowerStore customers already on the line. If you're currently running PowerStore and you have the, the, you know, the right switches, you can take that, you know, say iSCSI deployment that you're running now and, Convert that over to NVMe over TCP, uh, right, for your VMware Hyper-V environment and just get that much better performance, you know, out of out of the you know, technology that you already have in place, right? So really, it's end-to-end -end NVMe. One of the things I like about PowerStore is the way that it scales. Um, you know, I've worked with uh, a bunch of storage platforms over the years, and a lot of times, you know, you only need a, a few more terabytes for a new project, but you're forced into buying, in a, you know, an entire appliance or, you know, half a shelf. The way that PowerStore scales is one drive at a time. We've been installing PowerStore for, you know, like I said, three and a half years now, and we've had a lot of folks uh, that were early adopters that have added, you know, one or two drives, um, you know, over the years, and they just budget like, hey, we're going to plan on needing a drive every year, and we're just going to add that to the budget, and they're able to pop those in one at a time and, and scale that way. Uh, once you fill that to your appliance, you can scale the um, solution by either, you know, daisy chaining additional trays of disk, 
again, also over NVMe connectivity between the head unit and the expansion trays, or cluster multiple appliances together and manage the entire solution kind of as, as a federated storage solution, right? So, so I work with a customer locally that has a couple of power stores already clustered together, managed, you know, is, is one solution. Um, one thing I'll call out on the built-in data protection, uh, this is a, a brand new feature that came out over the summer, uh, the acronym PPDD, that is Power Protect Data Domain. So if you already have data domain in your environment, what this feature um, enables as of the 3.5 release over the summer is to take snapshots from your power store and extend the kind of protection off the power store directly to data domain, right? So you're used to using data domain with some sort of backup software orchestrator. Um, you know, maybe it's like PowerProtect Data Manager, Avmar, um, you know, some third-party product. Now you're able to take snaps directly from PowerStore and move them over to data domain. Um, NVMe uh, storage technology is incredibly fast, but it's also, you know, still a bit of a price premium over um, traditional SSD. One thing that Dell has done really well is they've developed an inline deduplication and compression engine that's always on. It's not configurable. It's not, you know, per volume. It's it's always on for all workloads with no performance hit to, you know, to the rest of the system. It works so well that Dell has a written four to one data reduction guarantee. So that means, you know, I mean, simple math. If you have 25 terabytes of, of flash, that's 100 terabytes that you can use in your environment. Um, that written guarantee, it's like two or three pages. It's pretty simple to, uh, to understand, but there um, are a couple of data types that are called out uh, that, are, that are excluded, right? So not all data is going to deduplicate or compress at the same rate. So think if you have a lot of like PDFs, images, video, um, we can certainly account for that if you want to put it on PowerStore, but it's not going to just know that it's not going to deduplicate or compress, you know, as well as other, other documents and file types in, in the environment. Um, what we typically see um, with deployment, you know, if you're not intentionally designing a solution, like a, a separate type of solution for, let's call it your rich media, a lot of folks blend somewhere in that two to three to one. Right, so that same 25 terabytes of NVMe data or capacity is maybe 50 to 75 terabytes of, of effective capacity without having to worry about you know a separate storage appliance for you know the rich media in your in your environment. Um, but like I said, it is a written guarantee, uh, and there is some um, you know Dell stands behind it. We've had uh, multiple instances where you know there wasn't a large percentage of that rich media, and, and so. Uh, customers still weren't experiencing, you know, the, the data reduction that they were expecting on the platform. Uh, we work with Dell support and Dell has actually sent, uh, you know, just additional free drives to, to multiple customers to, to make it right. Right. So, you know, the written guarantee is great, but it. Um, um, yeah, so so, I mean, like, like I said, the, the written guarantee is, is there. Um, but just know that, you know, we're going to have a lot of uh, kind of in-depth sizing conversations to understand your specific data type before we just say, you know, hey, you need 100 terabytes, here's 25, it'll work. Um, and then Cloud IQ. I hope uh, if you have Dell Technologies in your environment that you are already leveraging Cloud IQ. It came out in 2016 and it is a completely free software as a service hosted by uh, Dell as long as you have active support contracts. So it came out with the launch of Unity, but it has been expanded to work with data protection products. It works with server products. It works with uh, like PowerScale. It works with just about everything in the Dell Technologies Enterprise portfolio. And what it is, is it's a, just a dashboard to log into to get uh, health scores, security scores, um, you know, maintenance checks, right? So you can see kind of what code you're on, what target code might be. And sometimes you can even push upgrades from right there in the portal. Um, it is, you know, like I said, it, it's a it's a online application, but it also has an app, right? So if you'd rather do everything like from a from a um, like your phone or tablet, you know, there is an app as well. So super simple to use and, and completely free. Uh, and so of course, you know, PowerShell plugs into to Cloud IQ uh, along with all of your you know Dell servers and, and everything else. It's the wrong way. Right. So the one call out here I'll talk about is the anytime upgrade. Um, you know, moving from one technology to another technology, sometimes, you know, there's maybe planned outages or, you know, migrations that have to take place. 
And so what Dell has done is uh, designed PowerStore in a way that once you are on PowerStore, it is completely upgradable from one version to the next without having to, to move your data around, right? So uh, when PowerStore launched in you know, 2000, it was on the first generation hardware. Uh, about a year and a half ago, they launched a second generation, right? So the first generation was like a PowerStore 1000. Now they've got a PowerStore 1200. So what the Anytime Upgrade program does is think of it like an insurance program where you can cash in your upgrade at any point, right? So if you purchase PowerStore with like a three-year support contract or five-year support contract, any time during that support term, you are entitled to upgrade your system. Now there's multiple types of upgrades, right? So you can go from current generation to the next generation, but let's say um, you know, you're already on a 1200, uh, a PowerStore 1200, and now you want to implement like a VDI initiative and it's gonna push you know, way more workload onto the system than it was really designed to, to handle from the get-go. Uh, instead of going you know, from current generation to next generation, you can also go from uh, current level to next model higher, right? So like a 1200 to a 3200. Um, so it, it's a great program. It doesn't require you to extend your support contracts. Like, um, you know, I, I know some, some other kind of refresh programs that are out there. Uh, so, you know, as long as you have uh, like pro support and the anytime upgrade program, uh, you are entitled to these types of, of upgrades on your system. Um, if you're doing these type of controller swaps, it's completely, you know, no downtime, no migrations. You're just going, you know, from one generation of hardware to the next generation of hardware. And again, this is the only slide I have on like the actual PowerStore technology itself. So, I mean, if you have questions, we, we'd love to, you know, dive into, you know, drive sizes and, and protocol speeds and all that. It's just, you know, really we wanted to focus more on just how is PowerStore being implemented, um, you know, within, within the um, organizations that we work with. Does anybody have any questions about power store? Anything come to mind that we might be able to answer? I actually do see a question about power store versus Unity. Um, yeah, so Unity is a great uh, product. It, it launched in 2016 and it's on its third generation of hardware, right? So there was like the Unity 300, then the Unity 350. Now there's the Unity 380 XT and there are other models, but those are the kind of the three families that, that have existed. And Unity, when it came out, was hybrid or all flash. PowerStore is really designed to be all flash only. There are no hybrid options with, with PowerStore. So if you're just comparing a all flash Unity to an all flash PowerStore, Unity relies on you know, your traditional kind of TLC SSD type media, whereas a PowerStore is going to be NVMe. Um, Unity all flash is included in that same data reduction program, but Dell's guarantee behind Unity all flash is only three to one. That's because, uh, and, and whereas PowerStore is at four to one, and that's because, you know, they've uh, really, they took the, um, they, if anyone on the call is familiar with Extreme IO, it was an EMC product prior to the acquisition, but they took the deduplication engine from Extreme IO and brought that over into PowerStore to really give it, um, uh, you know, the, the, the I don't know, it's, it's a much more intelligent data reduction algorithm than, than what is available in, in Unity. Um, both platforms are multi-protocol, so they both support, you know, iSCSI, Fiber Channel, um, SMB, NFS, right? So, so they're both uh, file and block capable. Um, really where, where I see is PowerStore is kind of the, the next generation, though, of the, of the platform, right? So, I mean, the Unity XT launched in 2019, so the current model, so it's four years old. And I'll, I'll tell you, I have not seen a hardware roadmap beyond kind of the, the current generation hardware. There will be updates to, um, you know, the, the code running on Unity. It is still for sale. It is still a supported product. It's just all of the R&D effort is really being put into PowerShore going forward. Yeah, Brian, um, Ed, Ed had a question and, and Jimmy answered it in the chat around uh, support. And does Dell monitor the PowerStore unit 24 7. can you can you yeah, touch absolutely. on how they do that yeah so powerstore uh has two available phone home options so if the powerstore is kind of your only technology uh, from from dell uh, and you wanted to phone home that is built into the native phone home capabilities um like right there in the in the powerstore gui um if you have a broad uh or, or an expansive deployment of, of a number of different dell technologies all of them phone home and so Dell has developed a uh, virtual appliance for support assist. And so you can have all of your various Dell technologies products 
report into one uh, virtual appliance for support assist that then phones home. So you can have individual products, each phone home independently, or route all of that traffic through through a single support assist appliance. But that is a 24 seven um, monitor. I've actually heard instances where uh, tickets are opened on customers behalf before they even realize that, you know, there was a, a drive outage. Uh, same thing with with Cloud IQ. If you I mean, Cloud IQ is, is completely opt in. You don't have to use it. But if you are using Cloud IQ, you can get reports pushed like to your email uh, immediately as soon as, uh, you know, an issue is detected as, as well. Right. So that is real time monitoring of, of the environment. But uh, with that support assist, it does phone home directly into Dell support. And then, Brian, I, I know you touched on uh, kind of the deduplication ratios. Um, you want to talk a little bit about kind of the real world scenarios that we've seen customers maybe, you know, signing the, the guarantee to get four to one, and then maybe they're not necessarily seeing that, what Dell does there? Yeah. So, like I said, you know, a lot of our customers are, are getting somewhere between two and three to one, and that's because... Yeah, I mean, we know that going in, right? We we have those conversations to understand what the data types are, and they're like, yeah, it's a, it's a small amount of our data, but it's you know five terabytes, and we just know that that five terabytes isn't going to to produce well. Um, and so we go into sizing, you know, saying, hey, you know, we think this might blend to be a three to one type type deployment. But um, specifically, let's say, I mean, Ryan and I were working with a uh, organization that. Um, had, had deployed PowerStore and they were only getting two to one. They were getting half the capacity they were expected. They didn't have rich media in the environment. Dell actually doubled the number of drives uh, that they had originally purchased, right? So they had nine drives originally, and this is two different systems. So they had nine drives. Dell sent them 18 more drives completely free of charge. So that was nine drives per system to, to make it right, right? Because, I mean, Dell did their due diligence, looked at the data, saw that there was no rich media. I'm not I'm still not sure exactly why they weren't seeing, you know, the data reduction. Uh, I mean, there's probably images hitting hidden somewhere in that in that environment. But uh, I mean, Dell stands behind it, made it right and sent them, you know, 18 more more additional drives. Yeah, they also just to add on to that, not only did they send the drives, but they actually sent a second enclosure as well for additional scalability. Uh, and so Really, the message there is that, you know, Dell is holding up their end of the bargain on these four to one guarantees uh, across the board. And uh, we definitely encourage customers to to sign those particular guarantees um, as if you're evaluating PowerStore. Um, Ed has another question, Brian, around around clustering. Uh, does PowerStore support clustering specifically for VMware Metro storage cluster or similar to provide yes. stretch clustering across multi data center? Absolutely. So as long as you, so specifically talking about VMware and a, and a Metro cluster, PowerStore has a native capability called Metro volumes. And so what that requires is a very high bandwidth, very low latency link between your sites, right? You think at least 10 gig between sites, think sub five millisecond round trip latency between sites, but that allows you to stretch a single cluster across two disparate locations and basically treat it as one cluster. And then, you know, with a tool like VMware HA, if site one goes down, VMs can automatically reboot at site two. Just with the 3.6 release that came out earlier this month, they introduced a witness component to make that technology even better. What you really don't want to happen in a stretch cluster is for that link to go down, site two think that site one has failed and try to reboot VMs when they are still already running at site one. That third site witness component that is now available as of uh, PowerStore 3.6 um, mitigates that issue, right? So the witness component has visibility into site one and site two. So, you know, if the link between site one and site two goes down, that witness knows, hey, site one's still online, site two stand down. But that absolutely does work with VMware today. Um, don't put it on Twitter, but it is being expanded beyond. Uh, VMware workloads here in the next major release. But, but today it is exclusive to, to VMware. That's great. And then it looks like uh, Jimmy Young has a question around, this looks like it's kind of a generic question around immutability, hardware-based immutability within storage platforms. Um, is it possible to automatically provide a number of restore points so your production storage actually becomes part of your backup protection? 
Yeah, so uh, over the summer, uh, PowerStore released version 3.5, and with that, they um, released immutable snaps. Uh, and so snapshots can't be deleted uh, if they you know, are set to be uh, immutable. Um, so that is you know, potentially a way to recover from like a ransomware type event. What I think might also be interesting is the integration with uh, data domain, right? So if you have data domain, you can enable retention lock on the data domain. So if you are pushing snaps to data domain with the retention lock enabled, you know, that data is, you know, not to say that it hasn't already been impacted, but the data that is there cannot be cannot be changed during the, you know, the duration for that retention lock. Um, but yes, the, the immutable snaps is already a, a feature as of 3.5. Cool. And again, I mean, we could probably spend the, the entire time diving deep into PowerStore, um, but I want to make sure that we're, you know, conscious of time. Um, okay, so yeah. um, and I'll sure. take this as a last question and we can, I mean, I'll, I'll still be on the chat, you know, we can chat during the, uh, the mixology too, but um, transferring storage. So PowerStore does have the ability to natively import from other Dell technology storage platforms, all right? So if you have Unity, if you have Compellent, if you have Extreme IO, Dell can natively import a lot of those workloads without leveraging technologies like storage vMotion. Right, so if you are in a VMware environment, a Hyper-V environment, and you can use the like hypervisor itself to migrate storage, that's probably the easiest path forward. But uh, I worked with an organization that was running physical Oracle workloads on Compellent. We were able to transfer directly from Compellent to PowerStore uh, without impacting uh, the application. When that came out, it was exclusive to Dell Technologies storage platforms. It has since been expanded. I think NetApp was added. Um, Pure is not yet on on the list, right? So doing a non-disruptive migration from from Pure to PowerStore, we would be looking at a technology like a storage emotion uh, or like you know, as, as fun as it is, Robocopy, you know, if it's a file-based workload. But I'm gonna go ahead and, and continue into some of the case studies. But again, you know, if you have more questions, we uh, we can you know follow up offline or we can you know chat during the uh, the drinking. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds good, Brian. So let's let's talk about we've got three case studies we're going we're to review with everybody. Uh, the first one is actually a financial institution in. Uh, I'm actually not sure where they're located, to be quite honest, but um, these guys actually upgraded their old SC storage array. And for those of you that aren't familiar with SC storage, uh, maybe you've heard the term compellent in the industry. Um, their whole goal was to actually reduce kind of their colo footprint as well as cost uh, to increase capacity and performance. Uh, so Brian, how did Davenport Group help in this particular situation? Yeah, and so this uh, this was another longtime uh, Davenport Group customer. Uh, they had their own data center that they had gotten kicked out of. And so, you know, they'd made a business decision to move to co-location facilities. And so they still had two data centers. They had a primary and a secondary, both at separate uh, colos. I mean, managed by the same company, just in different regions. Um, but you know, with the Compellent, they had been a very long time uh, user of Compellent, and so they had a lot of small spinning disk in their systems. And you know, to reach the 300 terabytes where they were, it just took a lot of shelves. And so they had two full racks at each of these colocation co facilities, just full of spinning disk. Um, you know, and so if you're familiar with Colo, a lot of times you're charged by, you know, the, the rack unit or the rack, especially the power, uh, all of these different things that, you know, storage, I mean, their, their previous storage, the, the compellent, I mean, it just took a lot of space. And so, you know, we, we ran some sizing exercises and were able to consolidate from two full racks of storage down to a single 2U appliance with over 500 terabytes of effective capacity. Right, so PowerStore has a number of different drive sizes available, as small as like two terabytes up to 15 terabytes. And so, using some of those 15 terabyte drives, we got them over 500 terabytes of effective capacity in that 2U footprint. Moving from spinning disk to you know NVMe SSD, they went from over like you know 10,000 IOPS or so for you know a couple hundred spinning disk to you know 100,000 IOPS on the um, PowerStore platform. So drastically shrunk, you know, the, their their colo footprint, saving you know a lot of cost in the in the process. That's great. 
So on the second, the second case study is a little bit different. Uh, these guys are actually a local government, uh, and they were upgraded their legacy non-Dell technology storage. And they are trying to provide uh, near zero recovery point and recovery time objectives for critical health and safety systems and eliminate Oracle support cases. Brian, you yeah, want to touch and, on this one? Um, yeah, so, you know, Davenport Group works with a lot of like uh, state and local governments across the country. And, you know, a lot of these SLED customers run like true tier zero mission critical workloads, right? You think like 911 dispatch type type workloads where lives are actually at stake, you know, if, if, if systems aren't online and available. Um, and so uh, going back to the question about, you know, metro volumes and active active um, capabilities within PowerStore, uh, this was a, a VMware shop. And so what they were able to do was leverage that native ability to, to deploy metro volumes um, it's a county, you know, so they had their own dark fiber, which, you know, made it a lot easier to hit the bandwidth and latency requirements, but stretch, you know, far enough to have kind of facilities on, on you know, opposite sides of the county. But we um, deployed metro volume. What, uh, so synchronous replication, what that really means is, you know, every single transaction that comes in on the, um, on the, on the primary system is duplicated at the second site before it's even acknowledged back to the application. And so, you know, not a single transaction is lost. And then now with the you know, witness component that just came out a few weeks ago, even if that link goes down between sites, those workloads will automatically reboot. Um, you know, well, I guess going the, the witness will dictate, you know, if they need to reboot at the second site or not. But the way that they had it set up was, um, you know, without the witness to, to go ahead and reboot at the second site if, if the second site would detect anything wrong with the first site, just because that witness component wasn't available. And so you know, you're talking about a brief outage to do like a reboot, but, um, you know, it, it's, it was critical for them to make sure that, you know, their application suffered near zero kind of kind of outage. And we were able to achieve that with the with the native metro volume that, that came out in um, 3.0 last summer. Uh, the other thing was, you know, this customer was a large Oracle, um, had a large Oracle footprint. And you know they had a hybrid storage array, and they were constantly on the phone on a weekly basis with Oracle trying to diagnose various performance issues. After moving to PowerStore, it completely eliminated all of the performance issues within the environment, and they freed up like literally multiple hours every single week just by moving you know from a hybrid storage system to this PowerStore, um, you know, with, with NVMe technology. Oh, Jace is here. It's time to time to get ready. <laughs> All right, let's get through uh, the case study, and then we'll talk with uh, John and Jimmy, and then we can get on to the cocktail making. So, this third case study was a national law firm. Uh, these folks were trying to consolidate four separate, uh, both Dell Technologies and non-Dell Technologies storage platforms to reduce complexity without sacrificing the benefits of the existing solutions. Yeah, and um, so this particular uh, customer had purchased really point solutions for specific problems that, that they were facing, right? So they wanted like a, a resilient NAS environment to replace like the Windows server that they had. So they went and found, uh, actually it was Dell Unity was the platform that they had purchased, you know, specifically for the NAS capabilities built into Unity. Uh, they um, had some some extreme performance requirements. Uh, and so they had an all flash system specifically for those, you know, performance requirements. Um, they had another system just because they liked how it was easy to manage. And then I don't even remember what the fourth, but yeah, so they had these four different point products, each with their own management interfaces, each with their own support contracts. You know, we talked to them about everything that PowerStore could do. And, you know, it was almost like a light bulb, like, wait a minute, I could get rid of all four of these products and consolidate everything that we're doing onto just one platform, right? So I don't think I called it out, but, um, you know, encryption is something I hear in almost every conversation, right? Some sort of either internal or external requirement for encryption. Uh, PowerStore does have data at rest encryption always on. Uh, there's not a way to turn it off or, or disable it. Um, by default, the keys are kept on the controllers themselves. There's no extra complexity required. If you do have a requirement to keep the keys um, you know, off the array, it does now integrate with third-party key managers. So if you have like a centralized uh, repository or way that you're, you're managing uh, encryption keys, uh, certainly support it as well. Um, but really at the end of the day, they're drastically simplify you know, the environment. Um, 
ease of use on PowerStore. I mean, it's an HTML5 interface. Um, it, it's super simple. I'd love to do a demo for you, you know, at some point in the future, just to show you, you know, how much easier it is to manage PowerStore versus what you likely have uh, in, in the environment now. That's great. Uh, to follow up on Brian's last comment there, if anybody's interested in a demo uh, of PowerStore, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. Uh, we can take your name down and we can go ahead and get, try to get that thing scheduled. Um, so let's let's talk to our panelists for, for a couple of minutes here. Uh, I think, you know, hearing it from existing customers goes a long way. Uh, you know, Brian and I can tell you all about the technology, but to actually talk to somebody that has actually implemented this this particular uh, box in their environment uh, really, really kind of tells the story better than Brian and I can. So, John, do you want to uh, kind of reintroduce yourself? Uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, your relationship with Davenport Group and uh, how PowerStore works for Bailey Nurseries? Yeah, right on. Hi, everybody. My name is John with Bailey Nurseries. So we're horticultural ag based in the, in the Midwest, the Twin Cities out of Minnesota. Um, we've been with Davenport for about 10 years. Um, like it's been discussed before, if something's short with Dell, Dell's kind of doing this whole, we're going to make it right, we're going to make it good. Davenport does a lot of that too with us. So the last 10 years of whatever, whether it's the the engineering team or the sales team, they they do the right thing. So they're not gonna under deliver. They're gonna do what they can to to hold true to their promise. The big thing for us was the the, the people that come on site, the actual engineers, the ones installing and implementing the the solution set, really do a fabulous job. Um, for us, we've talked to other people in our egg industry that have gone with some HP this, some Dell, some of this. Keeping everything for Dell for us was kind of a no-brainer. One umbrella with with that important Dell from from host to storage, it, it keeps us from chasing ghosts. You know, you can't find why this is slow or why this is underperforming. Made everything really run pretty darn efficient. That's great. Uh, when you started kind of your upgrade journey, um, what other solutions were you looking at in addition to PowerStore? I kind of touched on it there a little bit. Um, we looked at HP, talked to other people, and it was when they started to mix things. Some things didn't play real nice with other things. Some people that had some legacy other solutions that they couldn't really migrate and make make go the right ways. Um, so that kind of solved this uh, promoting the, the Dell product. And then what was the kind of ultimate decision or, or maybe some of the... Um overarching factors that made you ultimately decide on PowerStore. Obviously, commonality from a single vendor is is a huge selling point, but was there anything else that you'd like to call out there? Yeah, a lot of the sides that we, we've talked about early on in this presentation, especially from Brian, um, the compress, the dedupe, um, the ease of expansion, right? It's the, they promote this, you know, the, the four to one, and and we went through some some resources we're getting about three to one on the dedupe, so you don't have to buy as much storage as, as raw storage as you think you might have to. Um, but to expand, right? You don't have to buy a whole nother shelf, a whole nother enclosure to go through another purchase implementation, cutover, or whatever, to build this slide drives in and kind of grow. Even if the dedupe and compress isn't where it should be, and, and ours was as as promised, you know, what's the next five years of of your future going to look like? What projects are going to be sold in your company, and how do you grow and expand there. So that really worked well for us. That's great. And and currently, uh, what are you leveraging with PowerStore that you were unable to uh, with your previous storage array? Some of the, the simple things in the GUI, uh, we've touched on a little bit. The, the GUI to the PowerStore is really easy. We were never really big into the snapshots. I don't know if we just didn't spend the time on before. We we did come through the, the Compellent era. We did have a, a Series 30 back when, you know, we're in the Twin Cities in the Midwest. Compellent was a local success story for that, that company. Um, current PowerStore, we have the, the snapshots, the immutable storage. That was a big thing. We did the upgrade to 3.5. Very easy, very simple. A lot of people to help us along the way to implement that and, and to tweak it was was a big thing for the snapshots for us. That's great. Well, well, thank you, John. I appreciate you taking the time today. 
Uh, and thank you for being a Davenport Group customer. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Happy to be here. So uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jimmy Derrick. Uh, Jimmy, would you like to uh, reintroduce yourself to, to everyone on the call and talk about your relationship with Davenport Group? Happy to. My name is Jimmy Derrick. I'm uh, with Smith Anderson. I'm the IT security manager. Uh, I mean, like a lot of companies, I security is just one part of my job. SAN storage is another piece. Uh, we've been using Davenport for, well, we've started as a compellent over 10 years ago, and we acquired our compellents when Dell acquired compellent, literally by days. Uh, Dell installed our system, and it wasn't a week, two weeks later, I don't think, before we were introduced to Davenport to help help us with the compellent and to manage it and how to use it. And we've been working with Davenport ever since. Um, that's now through two compellents and into the power store. And we went to the power store uh, during 2020 during COVID and lead engineering and all, most of the, uh, the heavy lifting was just done by remote hands, literally on site. We had a couple of sets of muscle in the, in the building to rack and stack the units and using an engineer from Davenport and myself, we remotely configured, got the system hooked into our VMware environment and we were up and running. And that was just, we, there was concern, but I mean, it was just that simple, that easy to get it up and running. Um, and we've been happy ever since. We've been through upgrades now from 1.02 code all the way up to 3.2. We haven't jumped to the 3.5 yet, but that's coming soon. That's great. Uh, can you share your experience with the power store after it, it has been installed? I mean, being a legacy compellent customer, you're probably very comfortable with SC storage. Uh, have things changed for you and your team since it was installed? Uh, no. I mean, in a way, things have gotten better because we had compellent, we had hybrid, and we, well, spinning disks, they fail. We seem to have a fair number of failures with spinning disks. So it was every couple of months, call, have an engineer come and install a disk. Well, so far, three years, we have had no failures on for drives with our power store. We've only had one piece uh, to actually have a support call with that uh, that was needed. And I mean, it's been, it's been good. We've, uh, I said the management of it is simple. Uh, the best thing that we enjoyed as far as being a compellent customer was compellent had co-pilot. Their support was just phenomenal. Um, and it was a pleasure to work with. And when power store came into existence, Dell took, the engineering practices from Copilot and implemented it into the Power Store team. And it's just like we never left. So it's a pleasure to call support. I'm glad we're recording this call because that's the first time I've ever heard a customer say that. So um, outside of storage, are there other areas of your IT environment that you're utilizing Davenport Group for? Uh, we've used Davenport for many uh, envir uh, projects. We use the support or the software team for Windows 365 and Exchange. We've, uh, we've used the infrastructure team to do, replace all of our switches uh, across two, our two facilities. So we've used, um, and we've even worked with uh, the new security team that Davenport spun up over the last couple of years. So. Yes, we've used Davenport for many different projects and looking forward to continuing to use Davenport. Well, Jimmy, I know you and I have worked uh, together on, I think it was your first compelling array, and then I yeah. moved out to the West Coast and, and 
I, I couldn't be happier to see over the course of the last 10 years that you're still a Davenport Group customer and that you have uh, upgraded with us twice. Uh, if that that's a that's a big testament to to the relationships that we hold. So thank you so much for joining us today and and for uh, all the insight. Um, thank you. It's, a, it's actually a perfect segue uh, talking about some of the other stuff that Davenport Group does. Uh, over the course of the last uh, probably year and a half, we've actually rolled out a new managed services portfolio. Uh, this is a white glove, fully managed services offering uh, where we have kind of three tiers of service. And the reason that we rolled this out was really because we were listening to what our customers were saying. Our customers were saying, we have to do more with less. We don't have enough time on our hands. Uh, we love how your engineers come in and work with our teams. Uh, do you guys have managed services? And and we didn't for a long time. Uh, now we do. And so within these three different buckets really kind of depends on uh, where you might have a need. Uh, we have advise, advise and assist, and, and manage. Um, <clears throat> with advise, you get a dedicated technical uh, account manager. We do quarterly health checks. Uh, we do biannual patch upgrades, annual version upgrades. If you go with Advise and Assist, you actually get a block of 40 remote block hours. Now, these block hours can be utilized for multiple things in the environment from uh, networking to primary storage, uh, VMware, Microsoft, uh, really kind of a, a whole entire list of things that our engineers are certified in. And then if you're looking for something that might be uh, you need a little bit more handholding or maybe you need an extra set of hands on a regular basis, uh, we do have a fully managed offering and and this is a little bit more in depth and can be and can be customized to to your particular needs um it can include you know monitoring alerting configuration and documentation services uh, i was just talking with a, a client last night uh, who has just taken over a new environment and um she doesn't really understand what she has right now. And so she's going to talk to us about uh, some performance troubleshooting stuff and some configuration and document management portions of where they need some help. So if you're interested in, in talking a little bit more about Davenport Group Care, uh, we can get you in touch with your account executive and our engineering team. Um, on the other side of the Davenport Group Care aisle is, is actually DG Secure. I do not have a slide on DG Secure. But we all know security is very, very important in this industry, and we have one of the best uh, field chief information security officers on the planet. Uh, Brian and his team, Brian was a former customers, customer of ours that uh, worked for a DOD contractor, and he has built out our security practice. So if, if that's something that interests you, please let us know. We can, we can schedule a, a follow-up call there to talk more about our free security assessment, as well as uh, some of the DG secure elements of, of that particular service. So, um, all right, Brian, I think, uh, does anybody have any questions either about Power Store or Davenport Group or any questions for uh, Jimmy or John? So um, from a, cost per hour uh, on the remote block hours. So block hours are typically a set amount. Uh, you would want to work with your account executive on that. Uh, typically, we sell them in 40 hour chunks. If you need less time, uh, we can sell them in eight hour blocks. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I think it's probably somewhere between, you know, 325 to 350 an hour is probably a good ballpark number there. Um, so if if you are interested in that, I'd reach out to your account executive. All right. Well, um, if there aren't any other questions or we can talk uh, while we're making these smoky cocktails, uh, if you're interested in exploring Power Store, Davenport Group Care, DG Secure, or or really just kind of have a conversation about you know additional technology. Um, if you meet with your Davenport account team by November 22nd, so right in time for Black Friday shopping, uh, you will receive a Lowe's or Home Depot gift card of your choice. And um, if you are interested, uh, there will be an email, a follow-up email that's going to go out early next week. Uh, please schedule some time with uh, with your sales team. You know, have a chat with them, and uh, let's see where we might be able to help you out. So. 
All right. Well, I don't know about you guys, but uh, it's almost three o'clock uh, out here on the West Coast. And so for you East Coast folks, you're probably pretty thirsty. So I would like to turn it over to Marissa. Marissa, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having us. We are super excited to be here. Um, I see that you all learned a lot from Davenport Group and just want to thank you again for having us. My name is Marissa and I will be your virtual production host today for your experience alongside of your amazing mixologist, Jace McConnell. Um, but before we get started, I uh, just want to encourage you, if you haven't already, go ahead and open up those kits so that you have everything you need for this spooky smoked cocktails. As you can see, I love spooky season. So very excited about this one. Um, if you'd like to open up your cameras, uh, we encourage you to come off of mute, ask questions throughout. Um, we love to see your smiling faces and hear from you. Um, also, I will be uh, going over the steps in the chat. If you have a question and you want to just uh, type in the chat, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, but we are here to just have a blast. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jace McConnell and share a little bit about him, and we will get the fun started here. So Jace McConnell is one of the South's most recognizable and respected bartenders. Originally from Savannah, Georgia, McConnell got his start behind the bar in Oxford, Mississippi, where he started the first craft cocktail bar at James Beard award-winning restaurant Snack Bar. Jace was named Eater Magazine's National Young Gun, and after running the bar program for Edmonds Oast in Charleston, South Carolina, he began consulting for several restaurants across the South. His work has been featured in numerous publications from Garden and Gun to Popular Mechanics. So everybody give a big round of applause for Jace McConnell. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marissa. I appreciate that. Uh, it's great to see everyone here tonight. Um, uh, like she said, uh, I used to run bar programs across the South. Um, had spent a lot of time behind the stick. Uh, not so much anymore. I do more consulting work and, uh, you know, advisory kind of things, but I still get to talk about booze um, all day, every day for work. So it's super fun, but it is really fun to get an apron on and actually make some cocktails with uh, um, folks like you today. So um, we like this to be as interactive as possible. So if you uh, have a kit in front of you, go ahead and break it out. If you want to come off camera so we can interact a little bit better, um, the more the merrier. We like the interaction. Uh, don't feel like you can't come off mute and, and blurt out a question or a comment or an anecdote at any time. This is happy hour. It is supposed to be fun and relaxed. And uh, I mean, we're making cocktails. What's what's better than that? So uh, feel free to uh, engage as much as you can, because uh, I like getting to do this because I get to do this in front of people from, you know, you know, all walks, all places across the country, um, which makes me so excited, especially this time of year uh, when it's a little bit cooler. Finally, has cooled off a little bit in Charleston, South Carolina, where I live. So I'm really excited to get to make some smoky cocktails uh, and, uh, you know, just begin enjoying the evening. So um, we've got two cocktails we're going to make today. Uh, we are actually going, if you look at your recipe card here, uh, it's got my mug on the front, but you want to look on the back. Uh, we're going to start with the Hocus Pocus Gin Fizz. Um, then we're going to move into the, the first one, the rum and hide. So we're doing it in reverse order. There's a reason to this madness, but uh, we're going to work through it together. All the instructions are right there. So if you ever get lost, feel free to uh, refer to that. But shout it out. Put it in the chat. If you have any issues, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you make cocktails. Um, this is not rocket science. It is super fun and easy. We're just pouring stuff into a glass at the end of the day. So uh, we're going to do it with a little bit more flair because we are going to play with some fire. Um, and I want to get to that part. So let's go ahead and get started on our first cocktail, which is the Hocus Pocus Gin Fizz. Now for this one, we are actually going to be making our own special syrup to go into the cocktail. Um, it's going to be a rosemary syrup. So if you uh, find in your kit, your virtual speakeasy sugar kit, you want to go ahead and crack that open. And uh, if you're at the office and away from uh, the kitchen, it's ideal if you're in the kitchen, but you don't have to be. Um, if you are just near a heat source of some kind, if you can get some hot water from a, a, a coffee machine or the hot water tap at the water cooler, whatever, um, we just need to make sure that this sugar gets dissolved. Now, you're going to open up this bag, and there's a lot of rosemary in it, but a lot of sugar, too. And this is pre-measured. We want that rosemary to be intense. That's why there's so much of it. So go ahead and empty the contents of that into whatever you're going to be 
making your syrup in. That could be on the stove in a pot. It could be in a bowl. could be in a coffee cup. You know, whatever, you know, field conditions you are dealing with, there's a way to make this happen. Uh, it's just like making tea, essentially. Uh, to this, I'm going to add a half cup of water, one half a cup of water. Simple syrup is typically a one-to-one -one ratio of sugar to water, and that's what we've got pre-measured out for you. Today, we have added a bunch of rosemary to it to give it a little extra kick. Um, I love rosemary this time of year. It's very uh, reminiscent of fall aromas and flavors, so this is going to fit out, fit really nicely into our smoked cocktail that we're doing today. Uh, so I'm using a convection burner today. Um, you just want to give this a quick stir, no matter what you're using. Make sure that all that sugar is kind of incorporated. Um, very simple. I mean, it's simple syrup after all. We're not uh, not flambéing anything just yet. This is very, very quick and easy. Um, essentially, you just want to bring this up to a very light simmer. You can cut the heat off after heat off after that, and uh, just make sure all that sugar is dissolved. And that's what you're looking for. Essentially, shouldn't take too long before you start getting that lovely uh, herbaceous aroma kind of leaping out of the pot at you. All right, uh, in the meantime, make sure you have everything that you need in front of you. You will need some ice uh, and you're gonna need a couple cocktail glasses. For these, I just prefer to use rocks glasses because we have our special friend here, our cocktail smoking device uh, that actually sits right on top of your cocktail glass. So that's what you wanna have handy to uh, get that smoky element into your drink. Does everyone have everything they need in front of them? I'm looking for thumbs ups or shout it out. Looks good so far. Awesome. Good stuff. Um, yeah, th these are some of my favorite experiences because, I mean, my, I get to go back to my Eagle Scout days and play with fire. Uh, we're breaking a lot of rules, obviously, because I'm inside playing with fire. They tell you not to do that in Scouts, but um, we're going to make some concessions here. All right, so just give this a little stir now and then as your syrup is coming up to a simmer. Pretty quickly, you know, as you know, depending on the stove you're using or your heat source, you should start to get that rosemary aroma. Just like I said, uh, it that is exactly what you're looking for. You want to just like I said, it's kind of like making a cup of tea, except we're using dried herbs instead of tea leaves. How's everyone doing on their syrup? Everything coming along nicely? Looks good. I bet that smells amazing. I, I love that. Um, this is we're using dried rosemary here. Um, if you have a garden in your backyard and you have fresh rosemary, that's even better. Uh, and also, if you have that dried or that fresh rosemary, it's really fun to use that as a garnish on your cocktails in the future uh, because you can actually even toast that really quickly and put that on top of your cocktail. Adds a really nice uh, aromatic experience to whatever drink you're making, especially if you're doing something along the lines of what we have today. All right. So mine has come up to a simmer. That's all I need. My hey, uh, Jace. Go ahead. How much fresh rosemary would you use? Somebody does have a garden. That's so exciting. Oh, nice. Um, honestly, you know, you, you know, kind of rub it between your hands. See how intense it is. Uh, that's the first thing I would do if you've got some really fresh, uh, you know, hasn't quite dried out for the wintertime, vibrant rosemary. Um, for a half cup of water and a half cup of sugar, I would use maybe like five nice uh, long sprigs. Um, you can leave it on the stock or you can you can pull it off. It'll be easier to strain out if you leave it on the stock. Uh, just throw that in there and do just like we're doing here. Maybe let it simmer just a touch longer um, so that it, you make sure you get all that, uh, that, that um, aroma and flavor in there. Um, but yeah, after that, um, that's, that's good to go. Um, awesome. You want to discard those after that, but then Bear in mind, you can go back out, get another snip, and you can use that as a really nice garnish. Um, and that, that works for if you're making, um, you know, like a holiday punch for whatever holiday gathering you have coming up, you can scale up any of these recipes. Um, rosemary and cranberries and all that stuff that's in season this time of year is really fun to just kind of throw in the punch bowl and, you know, just, just kind of spice things up, make it, make it look fun. Exactly. Right, and next. Matt actually has fresh mint that he wants to put in to addition to the rosemary. Any objections? Sure. Uh, no objections, except mint is a much, uh, so rosemary is a lot hardier than uh, mint is. 
So I would add mint. If you were trying to make a rosemary and mint syrup, I would add the mint at like the last second, like right now. And I'd let that steep for maybe a couple minutes and then pull it right out. Um, the reason being, if you overcook the mint, um, at first it's going to release that menthol, that, you know, lovely green, fresh uh, aromatic that you want. But if you leave it in too long, it's going to start to release chlorophyll, which is kind of vegetal and bitter. And you don't want that in your cocktails. Uh, I always tell people, like, if you're making mojitos or mint juleps, you don't want to over muddle the mint. You just want to give it a gentle press to release the menthol, but not break down those cells so much that they release chlorophyll. Um, that's not as not as tasty. You know, you don't want it to taste like a can of green beans. You want it to taste like mint. So um, that's a great idea, though. Um, these kind of you know, whatever you have in your herb garden. I love putting herbs into cocktails. I don't think people do it uh, enough. And I, they typically when they do, they don't do it right. So with those simple tips, uh, I would encourage you to experiment and, uh, uh, you know, have fun with it. That's the best thing about cocktails, really. Like, even if you mess up, you're only throwing away about that much booze, right? You know, you can try again. It's not like if you mess up the whole roast for, you know, again, your holiday gathering. It's easy to, you know, try again. All right. <clears throat> now, my syrup is cooled off a little bit. Um, now, we're going to use... Our smoker friend here, he's going to pull double duty today. He's also going to act as a strainer for our syrup. So we have to do a little bit of a, it's going to involve a little bit of a, you know, motor skills. We're going to have to uh, <clears throat> strain off a little bit of this into the bottom of our cocktail shaker. So go ahead and put your buddy right on top here. And then what you got to do is kind of eyeball about a half ounce or so of liquid into the bottom of the shaker here. That's what we need for our cocktail. Um, the rest of this, you can save for later, let it cool off completely, and you can strain it through, you know, whatever, when you get around to it. If you have a, a, a strainer at your house, you know, feel free to use that for this. Um, but include it in your kit, this is what we're gonna use. And a half ounce, if you have kind of a standard shot glass, you're gonna use about half of it. Typically, they're around an ounce, unless you're using one of those, you know, like, this is an Alabama size, uh, shot glass that I got at the gas station <laughs> on the side of I-20, um, which I have plenty of because I've grown up in the South. And those are the really big ones. It's like a pint glass and they're calling it a shot glass. You know what I'm talking about? Don't use that. Use a regular size shot glass, about half. Um, and if you know you like your drink a little bit sweeter, a little bit less sweet, you can use more or less. Um, but I know everyone knows what they're into. So just follow your heart here. What we're going to do is just gently strain off about a half ounce of the syrup here. There we go. Nice and easy. There we go. He's all set. Really quickly, I'm going to rinse this out because we're going to use this to smoke our cocktail here in just a second. Rinse out your skull strainer. I love that skull. I think it's so cute. Yeah, he's a lot of fun. I've been trying to come up with a name for him, but nothing great has uh, come to me yet. If anyone has any ideas, please let me know. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to continue um, to make the rest of our cocktail. We're going to, uh, again, we are, we've, we've made the syrup. We are going to continue with step two, which means we're going to add our gin to the cocktail shaker. And don't, don't worry. We are going to get to the smoking fire fun part here in just a second. But we're going to go ahead and add that bottle of gin, about two ounces, to the shaker. Then we've got some lime juice here. Uh, and, of course, I would always insist on using fresh lime juice, but this company actually re makes really, really great shelf-stable juice. Uh, so I'd recommend this, you know, especially if you're traveling, you're camping, you know, whatever. You just don't feel like making fresh juice. These guys do a fantastic job. Um, so definitely recommend that. Recipe calls for about an ounce. So you want to do about double the syrup that you used, but again, follow your heart. You know, you want it a little bit more sour, you want it a little bit more sweet, you can adjust that as, as you see fit. And, and also bear in mind, if you finish the cocktail and you're like, this isn't sweet enough, this isn't sour enough, this isn't boozy enough, you can add more. That's, that's, that's your world, this is supposed to be fun for you. You're not making this for a crowd, this is your cocktail. All right, so. And just to confirm, you did an ounce of lime juice? Yeah, one ounce of lime juice okay. and a half ounce Double of syrup. It. And then Perfect. the uh, bottle of gin, which is about two ounces. All right. All right. We so have a name for the aside. skull. What's that? Gray skull. 
It's from Wait. some old cartoon. <laughs> Wait a minute. I know what that's. That's a. Uh... Oh man, don't tell me. Is that. That's not He Man, is it? Matt? No. I don't know. That's great. Yes, he says yes. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. All right. You got it. Yeah, it was a little before my time, He Man, but uh, I, 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 still, I still caught on to it, uh, you know, eventually by osmosis, <laughs> my older friends. All right, we're going to set our cocktail aside for now. And what we're going to do is get our cocktail glass uh, smoked and ready for the, for the cocktail. So what you want, again, if you want to use a coupe glass or stem or anything like that, you can just be careful because uh, this guy's, he's a little heavy and I don't want anyone to, you know, have any, uh, you know, breakage or knock anything over. Um, so go ahead and put our buddy on top of your glass. Make sure it's nice and dry, clean glass. Um, you don't want water on the inside of your glass because it makes the smoke um, kind of smell not great. It's kind of like when you douse a fire uh, you know, at a campsite and it gets that kind of wet oak smell. You don't want that. So next we're going to fill the top of, uh, gray skulls, uh, head here with some of these, uh, oak chips. Fill it almost all the way up, not all the way to the top. Just about like that. Just, I mean, nothing crazy, not too much, not too little. All right. And next, you can crack open your nice new butane lighter that you've got. Um, these are refillable. Uh, follow the directions as to how to do that and be very careful with it. But what I've done, uh, there's a little nozzle on the bottom here. I crank that all the way up so I get a nice, strong flame. And I'm just going to start torching the wood. And your, your, your flame may go out a little bit as you go through. That, that is completely normal. Just reignite. Keep it going. Ooh, now, bear in mind, if you are still smoke. at the office, watch out for your smoke detector. But I mean, <laughs> this is a smoked cocktail experience. So, frankly, I don't know what you expected if you. There we go. And after a little bit, you should see a nice, thin, silky stream of smoke descending into your glass. That's exactly what you're looking for. It's super cool. And obviously there's gonna be plenty coming up this way too. There we go. But that the force that of the butane great. kind of forces it down into the skull. It kind of condenses a little bit and then falls into your glass. So while that continues to smoke, I'm gonna gently move this over here. Hey Jay's. Yeah. Can everybody still see Jay's? I lost you. I don't know if it's just oh. me or everybody. Can I get a thumbs up? Can you all still see Jay? Oh, sorry Lost about that. Him. Okay, you're back. You're back. Am I back? Sorry, yeah, I, I got yeah. a weird notification on my <laughs> device, and yeah. I had to get rid of it. I didn't notice. All right, everyone following along? We got our, our glasses smoking. We're, we're good to go? Cool. Yes. Matt all says right, he got smoked out. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next we're going to add some ice to our shaker. Not too much, not too little, but you want to make sure there's enough in there to give this a nice. Uh, we're going to be chilling this down, diluting it, getting it nice and frothy. What we're going to do, we're going to shake this up, get it nice and cold, and we're going to pop the strainer on, or pop the strainer off, I should say, and strain this into our glass. And it's going to be a little bit like uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. That, that first scene, we're going to be moving the skull and pouring the cocktail in because we want to catch the smoke, right? So just like that, seeing if you've, I know we've probably seen that. It's, we've all been to Thanksgiving dinner or something like that, and it's always on. So here we go. <clears throat> Pop on the top and the cap. We'll give this a shake. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> I sure see some shaking. Nice and hard so that, uh, you know, you're trying to wake this cocktail up and not rock it to sleep. So that's what we're going for. All right, when you're done, get the top pulled off there. And then just like I said, just like in Indiana Jones, remove the top, pour it right in. Boom, just like that. There we go. And then to give this a little effervescence, lengthen it out a little bit. I'm going to add some soda on top. 
And then if you'd like, we've got a dried lime for you to use as a garnish. You can crack that open and throw that in there. I think the dried lime makes it pretty. <laughs> yeah, you want to have something to play with in your drink, right? Yes. Do you want to make your drink pretty and come off camera? I will take a group photo. Yeah. I always love to see everyone's creations. Looks there it good. Is, Hope you all enjoy. Cheers. <laughs> How does it taste? Tastes good. Ryan nodding. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, well done, everyone. So <laughs> this goes to show how easy it is to make these fun smoked cocktails at home. Next time you have a couple friends over, it's real easy to uh, recreate this and uh, you know do something fun with it. Uh, so your, whatever your favorite drink is, whether it's one of these or something else, real easy to uh, you know smoke your cocktails. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. All right, we've got a whole nother cocktail to make, so I'm going to kind of reset here. You want to rinse out your shaker and uh, um, give, well, actually, you don't need to worry about him. We've got more wood chips you can just pile on top of that, so you don't have to do anything um, with our skull friend here. I'm just going to rinse this out real quick and be right back. Awesome. While you are rinsing out, I have a trivia question, and there is a swag kit up for grabs. So you wanna be quick to respond here. I wanna know, what is the most popular Halloween candy in America? Put it in the chat, shout it out. What do you think is the most popular Halloween candy? Candy corn, Brian says, it's not candy corn, keep going. M&Ms, no, good guess. You're getting closer, not Snickers. <laughs> my favorite nope not snickers not snickers i'll give you a hint not reese's i'll give you a hint they're very colorful not tootsie pops <laughs> taste the rainbow skittles you got it brian <laughs> Give a round of applause. All right, Brian, we'll have to get your mailing address so we can send you this uh, swag bag. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, Jace, back to you. All right, y'all. Uh, we've got one more really fun cocktail to make. This is called the Rum and Hide. Uh, this is a rum old fashioned. Um, I love old fashions. I love bourbon and old fashions. I love, um, you know, rye, whatever you like to use. But a lot of people kind of don't think about the possibility of using, you know, other things like rum, cognac. You can even make a gin old fashioned. You can make a vodka old fashioned. It's a little weird, but uh, it's a very versatile drink. You can use your favorite spirit in it because uh, essentially it's four elements. Uh, it is booze, sugar, bitters, and water. Uh, today we're going to be using rum for the booze. Uh, we've got some aromatic bitters. Uh, we're using some pumpkin spice syrup as the sugar. Uh, and then for water, obviously, we're going to be using ice because that's what you do these days. The old fashioned dates back to the eight, early 1800s. Um, there's a lot of lore surrounding how it got its name and who invented it and all that. But uh, it's the original cocktail. So it's a really fun thing to riff on and uh, have a lot of fun with. So this one is uh, going to be a little bit more straightforward. Uh, what we're going to do is build our cocktail in our uh, shaker tin here. Uh, but this is a stirred drink. We are not going to shake it. We're going to add a little bit of ice once we've built it give it a swirl, and then we're gonna have our glass smoked and ready to receive the cocktail, add some ice and a garnish, and we're off to the races. Really fun, really easy. So let's go ahead and we're just gonna follow again down the instructions. We're doing the rum and hides cocktail on top. Um, so just like it says, we're gonna add two ounces of rum. So just throw that mini bottle right in there. Just like that, and last, just like last time, we're going to use about a half ounce of this pumpkin spice syrup. Um, so it's pretty easy to eyeball. You know, if you want your drink a little bit less sweet, you can obviously back off on that. You want a little bit extra pumpkin spice flair in your life? Go ahead and add a little bit more. I like about that much. And again, this is an easy drink. If you don't think you added enough, or if you added too much, you can adjust later. You can add more syrup. You can add more bitters. Uh, you can add more ice and kind of you know rounded the drink out if you if you're not happy with the balance that you struck. 
Um, now we're going to add some bitters. Now, bitters are kind of like the salt and pepper of cocktails to me. Uh, I look at bitters the same way I look at my spice cabinet when I'm cooking at home. Um, these are aromatic bitters, kind of the, the workhorse of the bitters world. Um, we're going to add two dashes of this. This has an eyedropper in it. Two dashes is going to be about equal to about half of this eyedropper. Um, but I like bitters a lot, so I'm going to add a little bit more to mine, but follow your heart on that. If you want to taste your bitters first, you know, kind of see what you're dealing with, um, I'd recommend you do that because they are sort of a very intense uh, tincture of lots of herbs, spices, and bittering agents. So kind of want to know what you're dealing with there. Um, some people are obsessed with them, like me, and I love lots and lots of bitters in my drinks. Some people want it a little bit lighter on that. Completely up to you. So. That's everything we need in our cocktail. So I'm gonna set that aside. And just like last time, I'm gonna get our cocktail glass smoked up. All right. So I'm gonna to top off our friend here with some more wood chips. Just like that. And we're gonna go ahead and start torching just like last time. Very cool touch of the smoke. Yeah. Again, okay, there we go. We see that smoke descending from the bottom there. That is what you're looking for. I could do this all day. This is so much fun. Cool. <laughs> all right, we'll go ahead and get our garnish open and ready. Is it a lime? That's Another lime? Oh, uh, no, we have an orange for this one. Oh. All right. There we go. All right, let's go ahead and get our cocktail uh, chilled and diluted. We're going to add a little bit of ice to the cocktail mixing tin here. Just a little bit. I don't want to over dilute this. I like my old fashions very unmessed with. I like them to kind of just be fairly boozy up front. And as you drink them, you, they kind of change as you go. Um, but you don't need a spoon or anything for this, but we're not going to shake it. I just kind of like to stir this around. If you want to use a spoon, you totally can. But like I said, you don't have to mess with old fashions very much. Just a quick little swirl, kind of like that. All right. Put our cocktail strainer back on there. And again, just like last time, like Indiana Jones, we're going to pull off the skull and we're going to pour our drink right in there. So here we go. One, two, three. Beautiful. Just like that. Now, if you want, um, and I would recommend adding just a little bit more ice to this. Not too much, not too little. And you can throw in your dehydrated orange as a garnish. And there you go. That's the rum and hide, our smoked rum old fashioned. Hope you enjoy. Cheers. Very cool. Oh, we got a recipe in here. Yeah, sorry, guys. I just got my mic working. That's why I've been typing the whole time. Uh, Jace, I don't know if you can see that, but Davenport, you guys gave me this, this, uh, uh, the base recipe about a year ago for this. Oh, oh cool. So this is not your, uh, your first rodeo with, uh, with the smoked cocktails. Oh, don't judge me. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> very, very nice. Very cool. How do we, how are we enjoying it? Everyone. Thumbs up. Off. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome, Jace. This is great. Thanks so much. That's that's yeah. great. Great yeah. to hear. Uh, Marissa, yeah. do we have some more trivia? I think you mentioned you had we a few do. questions that you were uh, that you were excited to uh, throw out there. Yes, you know, with my spooky. I don't know if you guys noticed my spooky glass. Unfortunately, it's not booze like you like yours, but I have my water in this. <laughs> so I have a fun fact. Did you know that 35 million pounds of candy corn is produced each year? You know, some of you thought it was candy corn, even though it wasn't. 35 million pounds. Insane. And question for you all. Which U.S. state produces the most 
pumpkins. Shout it out, put it in the chat. Which state do you think produces the most pumpkins? While you sip on your drink, we can have a little fun guessing. I see Ryan thinking about it. <laughs> Mike says Texas. It's a great guess. Not Texas. <laughs> I, was, I can't um, say it. I, I Googled say. it, so I can't say it. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> okay, we've got John says Oregon, David says Idaho, Valerie says Iowa, Ryan says Ohio. No, no, it is actually Illinois. Illinois. <laughs> Matt was ready with the answer. Love it. <laughs> Illinois. Who would have thought? <laughs> Very cool. Thought. Also curious, which was better in your opinion? Drink number one, Hocus Pocus, or drink number two, Rum and Hide? In your opinion, which drink was better? David says like, drink one. Yeah, I like drink Go one as well. Right. Okay. Yeah, drink Good two. To know. Oh, Matt's changing it up with drink two. Yep, and drink three. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. We've got some more ones in the chat too. It's yeah, a Chase, mix. actually, it's I'm a not I'm mix. not a gin guy, but that was really good. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Gin's a very versatile spirit. You can use it in a lot of different things. Uh, obviously, yeah. play, plays well with herbs because there's a ton of different herbs, spices, citrus, all that in gin. But uh, um, you know. And, uh, I understand why a lot of people aren't gin people. Uh, there's a lot of really good gin out there that I don't think people get into. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not really anything to be scared of. It's just flavored vodka. Yeah. So let yeah. me tell you otherwise. Yeah. Well, we have All a right, couple so. of minutes left here. Does anybody have any questions for Jace specifically before we head out? You've got him here. You can ask any drink question you'd like. This is the man that knows it all. <laughs> I talk about booze all day, every day. That's that's what I'm here for. Yeah. We mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, mint, mint leaves and chloroform, which I which I did know about. If you leave them in, if you leave them boiling too much, I mean, but usually like people tend to, you know, put them in hot water and then mash them just to get the juices out, and then they discard the rest. Is that normal? Well, chlorophyll, not chloroform. Chlorophyll. About... Chlorophyll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> chloroform. Or form. You should definitely stay away from that in cocktail. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, if, if people are over muddling, over cooking their mint leaves, um, that's just what you're going to get. You're going to get a bitter kind of uh, vegetal um, taste that uh, is mm -hmm. not what you want. Uh, you want that crisp, bright, menthol-y, you know, beauty that you get from fresh mint. Um, and another thing is anytime you put mints into a cocktail, it's a great idea to put a fresh sprig of mint on top of it and give it a good little smack on on your hand or on the side of the glass mm -hmm. to kind of wake it up because mm -hmm. then yep. you're going to get even more of the aroma that's going to complement everything that's going on on the palate so uh one of the things i always instruct my bartenders to do is take very good care of your mint make sure that it's nice and clean that it's properly trimmed shocked um and beautifully display, displayed on the bar so that it's easy to use uh you have plenty of it and uh, it just makes for a, such, it makes such a difference on top of your cocktail. You know, if you get a Moscow Mule, a Mojito, a Mint Julep, anything like that, and the mint's just like a wilty and like the tips yeah. of the leaves are black, it just, it really ruins the vibe. So um, bright, fresh mint, um, which is easy to come by most of the year here in the South. We're lucky for that. It's like a weed. Um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I, I um, encourage everyone to keep some around because even, not even for, just cocktails, uh, a sprig of mint here and there in a lot of dishes where it's unexpected is very welcome. Awesome, great question. All right, well, I have put up our social card here. Um, you can scan your QR code. We love to see your creations. So if you'd like to take a picture of your drink and tag us, we are at VX underscore social. Um, Jace is at Derek the is it the dreaded Derek the dreaded yes that's my handle Derek uh, my, the first, dreaded. my first name is actually Derek I've always gone by Jace my whole life but if you want to ask me about where I got that handle you can send me a message it's a stupid story <laughs> but that's it's it's stuck with me and I can't get it right from it so 
I love it. Also, um, Davenport Group is on LinkedIn. So a big thank you again to Davenport Group for having us here. Um, go find them. I found them and followed as well. And um, you will be hearing from your account executive as they'll be reaching out next week for some follow up opportunities. So, oh, you can't see my image. I'm so sorry. I have it pulled up here. I don't know why you can't see me. I'll try to get it up, but if not, I will email it out to um, Davenport Group to send out to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank That's you, really everyone. Awesome. So glad you had. Thank you, everybody. Time. Thanks so much, y'all. Great hanging out. Thanks, everybody. See y'all again soon. I hope. Uh, take Thank care. Thank you. So just a, a quick reminder for everybody. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, if, if you are interested in talking further, let us know. Uh, if you can get something on the calendar by Wednesday, November 22nd, uh, you will receive a gift card uh, to Lowe's or Home Depot just in time for the holidays. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, we'll see you next time.